So nobody told these grains of sand what to do, but they formed a pattern. Now, such patterns are not unfamiliar to us, particularly in sand. For example, if we think of a flat beach without any wind, well, we wouldn't expect to see much other than a flat beach. But in the desert, where there's a lot of wind on a windy day on a beach, we know that patterns form in sand. Now, the wind's blowing all over the place, but it creates patterns. Somehow, the sand organizes itself. Order emerges out of apparent chaos. So we need to understand better how these patterns form in time. Now, over here, we've got a drum. It's got two types of grains in it. At the moment, it looks very disorganized. There's no particular pattern we can see. Now I'm going to turn on a motor. It's actually going to rotate this drum. And as it turns, just like the grains of sand, the grains will fall. In fact, you can actually almost see a pattern starting to emerge. Well, we'll come back to this. We'll give it time to organize itself. But while we're doing that, we're going to look a bit closer at sand itself. And I need a volunteer. Could you come down? And your name is? Amelia. Amelia. Any good at construction, Amelia? Resistance material. Right, well, that's good enough. That's, that's fine. Well, what we've got here is a dumper truck containing sand. And what I want you to do is just turn this handle slowly. I'm going to see what happens to the sand. Obviously, at the moment, as you turn it, that's fine. Keep going, Amelia. The sand's all on the back of the dumper truck. Nothing's moving. It's kind of dead. There are no patterns, nothing. Obviously, if Amelia turned it very high, all the sand would fall off. But what we're interested in is what happens in between. <coughs> Keep going a little bit faster. So we're now getting towards the moment when we expect a little bit of movement in the sand. You can see a few grains starting to move. That's it. Keep going. Now a bit slower now. That's it. So keep going. Because what Amelia's got to do now, of course, is keep increasing the slope. Whoops, that's it. A bit slower, a bit slower, a bit slower. That's it. That's it. Slower, slower, that's it. And what you can see now, just stop for a moment, just stop for a moment, is that there are movements of all sizes, actually avalanches of all sizes. We're in this kind of critical moment between no movement and having all the sand just drop down here. Could you keep turning just very slowly? And you can see little rivers form, and there are tiny movements and large movements. But actually, nothing's actually causing the large movements. Somehow, the whole thing's connected. It all kind of feeds back on itself. And these patterns just fall. That's great. Thanks very much, Amelia. And in fact, there was no typical time. If we'd been looking for a particular avalanche and asking the question, well, when's an avalanche of a certain size going to happen? There's actually no particular time. It's not like a bus that a certain avalanche is due. Let's look at our mixed grains and see how they're getting on. And you see, they're now forming a nice pattern. Now, nobody told these grains what pattern to form. They're just doing it. And it's by studying sand and granular material like this. The scientists have actually had some clues and insights into what this critical state is. One of the first people to do this was actually this man, Pierre de Gen. Now, Pierre de Gen got interested in sand because he was in the French Navy. But actually, he was in the French Navy, but they posted him in the desert, and that's where he first noticed 
these patterns forming in sand. Very much like these. So nature forms patterns. For some reason, it likes to. So if nature forms patterns in sand, and it forms it in these grains, and we could form order and some kind of structure in this rod, maybe the same thing happens in us. And that's what we're going to investigate. We have a machine here that detects heartbeats. Now, we think of the heart as the most regular thing in us. It's like a regular clock. It's a regular heartbeat, and that's what you have when you're healthy. Now, we have a volunteer over here who's already wired up and has agreed to have his heart monitored on this machine. Have to take a seat. Your name is? William. William. So William, we're just plugging you in. What I'm going to do is just start to record William's heartbeat. fairly regular to me. Very good. OK. okay. Now, William, I want you to help me analyze your own heartbeat. So what we're going to do, I'm going to rip this off. If you could just unplug yourself and come around the other side of the desk. Right, come, over, come around here. Come, come out here, will you? What we're going to do is we're just going to measure the time interval between William's heartbeat. We're actually going to measure it at a distance on here because that's what the trace gives us. So, William, can you just read off the interval between your heartbeat here? This first one. We're going from peak to peak. What's it? About 20. Mm. 28 millimeters, right, 28 millimeters along here. Next one. Right, next one. 27. 27 now. This one. 27. This one. About 29. 29. This one? 27. 27. Okay. Thanks very much, William. Thanks for volunteering. Thanks for going. So they're all around 27, 28, 29. That's what we'd expect. But that's the exciting thing that scientists have just found out. That actually, there's an irregularity in the heart, in the healthy heart. So William shouldn't be worried at all. This is very good. It's 27, 28, 29, 27. It's these irregularities that actually characterize a healthy heart. In fact, scientists have found out that it's when the heart gets too regular that there are actually possible problems. And it's not just with the heart. It seems that, for example, in the brain rhythms, in a healthy sleeping patient, they have an irregularity that goes away for a coma victim. 